Okay. Well, good morning. Welcome to Hopewell Presbyterian Church. It's a delight to welcome you on this, uh, okay, good, uh, wet uh, Sunday morning. If you're joining us on, on live stream, if we got that working, we were having some difficulties, so um, um, bear with us, but we're glad to have you with us as, as well. Um, announcements are in your worship guide. I, I'll uh, leave those uh, for, for you to read, uh, but just a reminder that we are going to do some decorating for Christmas because it's already that time. Um, immediately following the worship service, we'll have some sandwiches. Um, and you just got to remember, as you're decorating, it's different this year. So we got to leave space. And so things might look a little different. Prepare yourself for that, because this is a different year. Um, and so thank you for anybody that can help, that can help with that. Um, I think that's enough announcements. <laughs> and so I'll invite you, like we do every week, uh, to take a deep breath. To let go of the troubles of the week that was and your worries and fears about the week to come. To fix your mind on Christ and prepare your heart for worship. <laughs> Please rise and join this responsive call to worship from Psalm 95. 
Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. For the Lord is the great God. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The sea is his, for he made it. Come, let us bow down in worship. For he is our God. We, the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. And please remain standing for our opening hymn, hymn 206, Rejoice the Lord is King, verses 1, 3, and 5. Join me using the words uh, found in your worship guide as we confess our sins before God and one another. Holy God, you have given us many good gifts. Today, we thank you for all of them. But we also confess that sometimes we love those gifts more than we love you. We confess wanting more and more things, food, clothes, power, and money. Forgive us for not being content and thankful. Forgive our selfishness. Help us to love you more than everything else. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. So I got my eyes fixed this week, and I can see y'all clearly now, but now I have a new problem. I can't see my worship guide. <laughs> so work with me. Um, this morning, we have the privilege of receiving new members, uh, and so 
Grace and Caitlin, if you guys would join me up here. Now the real question is, what did I do? Uh, <laughs> you stay right there. Don't go anywhere. I think I know what I did with it. Time's a time. So if you're visiting, this is nothing new. In addition to my eyes not being good, neither is my memory. And so, so I get the questions right. So the session met this morning and had the, had the privilege uh, of receiving uh, Grace and Caitlin. Uh, Grace is a, a home health care uh, provider. Caitlin is a senior at Franklin. Uh, we found out, Gail, that Caitlin has musical talents and guitar and show choir, so she's probably already booked um, for a service. And so, uh, uh, like I said, uh, we've been through these questions once. I'd like for you to affirm them in worship um, because that's good and right, and it also reminds these folks well, what they have committed to once upon a time uh, before the session of Hopewell. And so... Here we go. Do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God and without hope for your salvation except for his sovereign mercy, do you? Yes. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the Savior of sinners, and do you receive and depend upon him alone for your salvation as he is offered in the gospel, do you? Yes. Do you now promise to resolve in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ, do you? And do you promise to serve Christ in his church by supporting and participating with this congregation in its service of God and its ministry to others to the best of your ability, do you? And lastly, do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, to the spiritual oversight of this church's session, and do you promise to promote unity, purity, and peace of the church, do you? And do you, people of Hopewell, uh, promise to love them well, uh, to, 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 in, to invite them in and make them feel welcome to be okay if they sit in your pew, but they've been here long enough, they've got their own pew. <laughs> do you? Do you promise to do that? Do you? you heard them. Uh, then, on behalf of, of the members of Hopewell, welcome to the family. It's a, uh, it's a unique family, um, but made of all types and all kinds, but it is the kingdom, and we're glad to have you a part of it. O ordinarily, I, I would... I would hug you, and I would encourage these people to hug you, but it's not ordinary, and so we're not going to do that. And I do have a book coming for you. Um, like all things, things take longer these days, and so we give new members uh, a copy of the ESV devotional Psalter, and whenever that arrives, I'll get that to you as well. So I would encourage you guys after worship to uh, socially distantly welcome uh, Grace and, and Caitlin, and you guys can be seated, and I'll, I'll pray. Um, so welcome. Uh, the prayer request, in addition to a praise for new members, um, are found in your worship guide. Um, I did get to spend some time with Miss May Rose uh, this week, and which was good for her spirit, I think, and good for mine uh, too. Um, she has been. Uh, really, I think, encouraged by being able to be with her family and friends. And, uh, but she is back at Ottermine uh, in a room, and her care is being managed by hospice. Um, but she is May Rose, and so I'm not betting against her, and I, I know you, you wouldn't either. But keep her and, and Mindy and Janice and the others uh, in, in your prayers. Um, and uh, May Rose sends her regards and her well wishes and her gratitude for your prayers. And I think everything else is up to date. Are there any other things? I want to keep, uh, continue to keep Jack Lee in your prayers as he waits for November the 30th so he can get a biopsy and see what next steps are for him. Um, other than that, let's pray. Almighty God, you are Lord of all, ruling and, and reigning over your creation, King of kings. And yet, 
You are our Father in heaven. Who we approach with our our cares and our concerns and, and and our praises. We thank you for the good things that are happening here at Hopewell, for bringing new members in, into our midst. We pray that we would uh, receive them well, that we would, um, as a session, be, be good shepherds, that we would, as a church, steward their gifts well to glory you. Father, in this season of COVID-19, there is much to be... Um, concerned about, but, but, but so many things that we are grateful for, even for the opportunities that, that 2020 has presented us, opportunities to slow down and to assess, opportunities to serve our neighbor, opportunities to pr- proclaim hope to a world desperately in need of, of the good news. Father, we continue to pray for our nation Pray for our president, President Trump and Vice President Pence. Pray for congressional leaders. We pray for President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris. We, we pray that, that the partisan bickering might be put aside and they would, they would seek to serve uh, the needs of the country in, in humility. And Father, we pray pray the prayer you taught us to pray together. Our Father. I will be done on earth as it is. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Amen. Our New Testament reading today is from Paul's letter to the Church of Colossae, chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. And if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and in earth, of which I, Paul, became a minister. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, Parker. And children can be dismissed for in your church. Hey, Parker, come here while they're doing that. Come here. Come here. Your grandma probably wants to see you. I was just going to let you wave at her. So if you're at home on the live stream, you couldn't see who was playing. But this knucklehead is who was playing. Parker Ricker, we're proud of you for using your gift. You can wave to your grandma. One of my favorite people to give a hard time to. He delights in returning the favor, though, so don't worry. Okay. This new glasses scheme's not working out, so you're just going to have to work with me. Psalm 24. Psalm 24 is a psalm that's often uh, read at Advent or Ascension Sunday. Seemed like a good psalm to me as we celebrate Christ the King and move towards Advent as well. And so you can turn to Psalm 24. And let's pray. Almighty God, our, our minds uh, come here with lots of business <laughs> running around. Our, our thoughts are prone to wonder. And so if you would, if you would steal our um, minds for just the moment, that we would hear your word, and that we would live differently in light of the truths that it proclaims. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 24. The King of Glory, a Psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of God, the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O ancient doors that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. God's word for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So the psalm, Psalm 24, uh, likely uh, written to be used in a procession as David had conquered Jerusalem and he is bringing the ark in. The ark where the Ten Commandments and other artifacts of, of historical significance were kept. The ark, a symbol of God's actual presence among his people. The ark was a was a holy thing. It was not something to be messed with. There were only certain people who had, who had privilege to be a part of, and even those who carried it had to carry it on these long poles. We actually uh, read, I don't remember where, probably Exodus, uh, where, where there's a stumble, right? And, and someone reaches up to steady it, touches the ark, and not good, not good for them. So this psalm was written for such an occasion. Commentar uh, commentators are, are almost unanimous in assuming and believing that this song, psalm, though, was also sung when Solomon consecrated the temple. David wanted to build the temple, you remember, and God said, no, that's going to fall to your, to your son. Seven years they worked on this amazing building. 
And one can imagine as, as Solomon led the processional in, this back and forth. Who is the king of glory? The Lord God. The psalm consists of three sections. The sovereign reign of Yahweh, the people coming to the Lord, and the Lord coming to his people. That first section, the sovereign reign of, of Yahweh, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world's and those, those who dwell therein. The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. Or said another way, the earth is the Lord's and all that fills it. The earth is the Lord's and the whole kit and caboodle, as Grandma would say. Not an inch, molecule, ounce, atom, whatever, does he not claim as his. In, the ver in verse 2, the psalmist reminds us that the Lord's claim on the earth is not a naked claim, is, is not without warrant. He claims it because he, he made it. He made it upon the seas, established it upon the rivers, out of out of chaos and disorder, he made this world. It is his. He has the sovereign right to rule and to reign. Verses 1 and 2 are important. They're important to ensure that the hearer, then and now, has the right perspective. It would have been easy to assume that this, as the procession of the ark was taking place, to see it as just another tribal deity. As they marched in with this box, the other deities would have had statues, but here they come with this box, an impressive box. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Not just any box, but a box. Singing praises to their God as they entered the temple, a pretty impressive temple nonetheless, but a temple. It would have been easy for them to assume that this is just another tribal deity. A god in a box confined by the constraints of the city walls or, or the temple. That's the kind of god most people like. <laughs> He's a safe god. That's the kind of god that most people are comfortable with. David says this is not Yahweh, the God of Israel. Not safe, not confined, limitless, Lord of creation. David wants to be sure you understand that before he moves on. Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, is Lord of all, creator and sustainer of all. The Bible goes to great lengths to tell us that he is sovereign over all things. It should not be news to you as a believer or a reader of his scripture, but it often is helpful to be reminded. And so a few things that God is sovereign over according to scriptures. Random things, seemingly random things. Proverbs 16, 16 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but its decision is from the Lord. He's sovereign over our daily lives and plans, Proverb 19, 21. Many are the plans in the mind of man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Random things, daily lives, also salvation. Paul tells us in Romans, God says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. He is sovereign over salvation. He is sovereign over life and death. 1 Samuel 12, 6, the Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and he raises up. One that we don't often like to say He's sovereign over disabilities and struggles. Exodus 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Who has made man's mouth when he questions his abilities? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? 
He is sovereign over the death of God's Son. Acts 2, Jesus who was delivered up according to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. He's sovereign over evil things. Think of Joseph. God sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was to be sold as a slave. As for you, you meant evil against me, but, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. And just to be sure we captured all, he is sovereign over all things. Ephesians 1, God works all things according to the counsel of his will. He is the Lord. Whether you know it or not, like it or not, he is Lord. So we see his sovereign reign. Secondly, we see the people coming to the Lord. The preceding psalm, Psalm 23, ends with, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Verse 2, I think it is, of Psalm 24. No. Verse 3. The psalmist asks, who is able to dwell in the presence of the Lord? Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? It's not a question. It's not a question we ask very much anymore. We've domesticated God. We think all roads lead to the same truth. But if you understand verses 1 and 2 of the psalm, you'd ask. But we don't. Because it seems offensive to a society that believes everyone is right. Your truth is your truth, and mine is my truth. We're all basically good. But coming before an earthly king, Coming before the mayor feels like a big deal, right? You don't just waltz in and knock on his door. And yet, and yet we've domesticated God, King of kings and, and Lord of lords. It stands to reason that coming before an infinite, holy, and pure King of kings is a big deal. And yet we want to interrogate God. Find reasons why we can't believe or determine ourselves what commands we will follow. We don't always explicitly do that. I mean, we're not like Hitler that goes through and just removes all the Jewish parts of the Bible and the things he doesn't like, right? We're not that bad. Maybe. Many say all roads lead to the same God. We rebuke that. And yet, there's a sense in which that's true. If he is creator and sustainer of all things, and history is moving towards a rendezvous with that creator. And so all roads will lead. The question is, what do you have when you stand there? Who can come before this king? The psalmist wants to know. And then he answers. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He who does not lift up his soul to what is false. Clean hands. He who has perfect actions. Pure heart. He whose affections are, are matched. And he who has a right relationship with God and man, who, who does not worship that which is false, and who, who bears truth to his neighbor. In essence, he who lives on Monday, like the liturgy claims, he's going to live on Sunday. Who shall ascend? 
Well, it would have been easy for the Israelites to assume me because of national identity. Me, I'll ascend, right? Me because I've been in the temple. Me because I go to church. And yet any of us, when we understand who God is, when the question is asked, who, a healthy step backwards in holy fear is an indication we've got it right. Clean hands, pure heart, right relationship. Now, it's not that those actions save us. We're saved by faith, so don't misunderstand me. But if you've been in Sunday school, then you know James has a lot to say about faith and works, that, that, that faith works itself out in action. The evidence of saving faith is in how we live our lives now. Clean hands, pure heart, right relationship with God and others. Kevin DeYoung puts it this way, you're one person worshiping one Lord with one heart. Not always perfectly, but that's the grid. That's the grid that, that you're moving your actions towards. Nearly every Sunday, I conclude the service with a pronouncement what's known as the Arianic blessing, that the Lord will lift his countenance, his face, upon his people. That's the greatest blessing for any person, is to be under the gaze of God's approval. And yet, because of being dead in sin, we can do nothing to merit his loving gaze. But we put our hope in the grace of of our Father as shown in Jesus Christ. In other words, there is nothing we can do to make our Creator love us or to achieve perfection that is needed for eternal life. But we're not, we're not saved by our works, but we're not saved for idleness. In the very same place, well, Paul, Paul will tell us that our absolute dependence is on Christ. That our deeds do not get us into the kingdom, but they demonstrate the faith that makes citizens of heaven. Our good works of obedience, they don't save us, but they give us access to many spiritual and physical blessings. Not ultimate blessings of salvation, but those who walk before the face of God's favor because they follow his word will experience temporal blessings. Will experience the assurance that they have saving faith. And that's how we understand today's passage. David expresses praise to the creator who has the right to the earth's fullness because he's made it. It and everything in it. We're going to go on to ask the question about who will have the right to stand in the Lord's temple. The place where the, where the favor of God was seen and, and felt most directly under the old covenant. Those who stood there must have clean hands and pure hearts to be faithful to the covenant. David certainly knew that perfection was impossible. It was impossible for sinners. That only divine grace could save him. And that's the remarkable paradox of, of this psalm. That the Lord of the cosmos comes down to live with his people, to covenant with them. The great paradox is that God is infinite, powerful, and holy, and yet, as we read in Isaiah, delights to stoop low to meet needy people. That theme resounds through the Bible, Isaiah 57. For this is what the high and exalted one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy, I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, to revive the heart of the contrite. My ESV devotional Psalter says of this psalm that the ultimate proof that this is who God is, one who is 
Lord of the cosmos, and yet one who stoops low to meet his people. The ultimate proof that that is who God is comes to us in the gospel. That in the fullness of time, the high and lofty God came near to his people, tangibly near, in flesh and in blood. The ark that David brought into Jerusalem was a box containing the, the presence of God. This, the son of David who came to Jerusalem was a man who himself was the presence of God. Although God the Son enjoyed eternal life in the presence of his Father, he drew near to needy sinners in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the true King of glory who will come at the end of history and to establish his eternal kingdom on earth. The phrase that's repeated throughout it is open the gates. Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O ancient doors, so that the king of glory come in. Lift up the gates. I kept thinking about that. Lift up the gates. How often are we so excited? And we chant and we sing. Think of the people on Palm Sunday. I'm getting my liturgical calendar off, but this would have been sung. Um, we know that the rabbis prescribed certain psalms for certain days of the week. This would have, psalm would have been read as Jesus came in on Palm Sunday. As the crowd shouted, lift up the gates. The king is coming, welcoming him in because, because he had an idea about what kind of king he was going to be. How often are we crying out for, for the gates to be open? That God is, is calling us into a deeper relationship. And we don't really want to fling open the gates. We want to crack it just a little bit. Let just enough God in. It's Advent almost. We welcome the little baby. So excited. We want the baby in the manger on Advent 1. That's not Advent. Now, there's lots of reasons we like the baby in the manger. He's cute. And it's a delightful message that, that, that God loved us enough to, to come in the flesh to, to rescue us. But on Christmas morning, he doesn't look like the king of, of glory. He looks like a weak and helpless little, little baby. I think the reason we're so comfortable with that story oftentimes is because it seems safe. The miracles and the teachings that, that later came, they intrigued the people. On Palm Sunday, there was hope he, he might be the one as they sang that song, Open the Gates for the King. And then it all came crashing down. The arrest, the beating, the crucifixion, the death. But Hebrews tells us that it was by his blood that he was making a way for us. Who can ascend? He was making a way for us to ascend. Who has clean hands? Who has pure hearts? Who had unrivaled devotion to his Father in heaven? Perfect obedience. Who can ascend? Jesus, our Messiah. He can ascend and, and he stands. And those who cast their hopes on him, you know, we stand too.
who can ascend? 2020 probably asks, has you asking, ascend? I can't even get out of bed in the morning. I'm scared to go to the grocery store. And yet, and yet we have the assurance of knowing that our Lord Jesus Christ who came and lived the life that we, well, we were supposed to live, a life that, that we were called to live so that we could stand in the presence of a holy God, a life that we continue to fail miserably at living. He came and he lived it for us. He paid the debt that we owed that had to be paid so that we could stand. We can do nothing to merit eternal life. But it doesn't stand to follow that we can do nothing to experience more of God's favor once that we're engrafted into the body of Christ through faith alone. And it is living in accordance by the power of the Spirit to, to His commands. Clean hands pure heart, right relationship, that we experience his blessings now and receive assurance of the blessings that are to come. We do that not on our own power, but by the very power that raised that Jesus from the dead who dwells in your heart. So be encouraged. He's ruling. He's reigning. And all will be well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we confess that we, we long to keep you safe in that, that manger. You seem so manageable there. And yet you will not be confined to a manger a box or to a temple that your rule and your reign knows no bounds and yet while you are up, upholding the cosmos and, and working the grand things out for your glory you are present with us supplying us with the grace and strength that we need to persevere We pray that you would convict us of those areas where our hearts and our minds are not clean. Where our relationships with you or with others are out of order. That we would move to, to bring those things into, into right relationship would be moved to, to, to live in a manner that, that is pleasing to you. Father, as we approach Advent, and an Advent is going to look and feel different, but perhaps one that, that looks and feels a, a lot closer to what Advent is supposed to be, a longing and expectation. Lord, we are longing for you to act expectantly. We thank you for the, for the faith that you have given us to endure. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand as we affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. 
he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn 197, Majesty. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Grace and Caitlin, it is a delight to welcome you into our little family. And um, I'll remind you, if you can stay and help us get Christmas put up, that'd be great too. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in his peace. Amen.